Sandra gets in. The dog is getting excited. <laughs> She's been away all day. Okay. I think your dog barking, um, Pat, is a good reason to start um, tonight's webinar. So look at everybody. You're very, very welcome um, to this evening's event. Um, and Pat's dog, look at Fair Play. No rubber will get into your house, Pat. Um, we're going to have a good chat tonight. We're going to chat about cap and nitrates, acres, succession. And then at the end, we'll have a few predictions for 2023 from our panel. Now, our panel is a, is a very good panel. We've Joe Healy all the way from Brussels. Um, he's ex-chairman of IFA. He needs no introduction. He's a member of the European Economic and Social Committee. He's a dairy farmer from Galway. But most importantly tonight, he is the chairman of Cultivate. We also have Pat O'Toole. News correspondent with the Farmer's Journal. He's a Wexford tillage farmer and he's the man with the dog um, <coughs> that's barking in the background. Um, we fill up O'Connor. He's head of um, farm support with IFAC down in Tipperary and dealing with farmers right across the country um, every day of the week. So, Joe, I might get you to open proceedings and maybe just welcome, welcome our audience here tonight. OK, thanks for that, David, and uh, indeed, uh, good evening to you all, and you're all very welcome, and thanks for joining. I know that we have a, a broad breadth of people from the credit unions that are involved in Cultivate to farmers uh, from all over the country and representatives from the different sectors along the food chain as well. So I, just a, a very quick word on Cultivate. I'm chairman of, a, of Cultivate, as David rightly said, and we're available uh, in almost 50 branches of credit unions around the country and that totals up to about 150 offices right around the country and basically what Cultivate is, it's a, a loan scheme for uh, short to medium term loans for farmers and uh, it can be got up to up to 75,000 unsecured and it came about four or five years ago as a result of uh, finance for availability for farmers and there was an EU funded study done at the time that showed that there was um, a, 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 I suppose a gap in the market for between 800 million and a billion euros to uh, farms around the country and there were a number of reasons given for it. First of all was um, you know banks not giving loans to viable farmers other places where they gave them the terms and conditions were so intense that farmers just didn't bother and then a number of farmers as well just not happy talking to a machine and feeding stuff into a computer uh, that was either rejected because the box not ticked there was no personal touch um so a few uh, came together in galway a few credit unions and it started off from there and i think you know, I'm a farmer myself, and a few things that I like are something that's quick, that's simple, uh, that's local, that has the personal touch, and um, the the minimum of bureaucracy. And the Cultivate Loans covers, uh, ticks all those boxes. Um, so, and I think that's what has led to its success. That unsecured loan has been available, and it's up to 75,000, but at a recent um, national meeting of credit unions uh, that yeah. were cultivate we uh, brought uh, to them uh, stuff that the board had outlined and board had discussed and that was um, to make secured loans up to 300,000 uh, that some of the larger credit unions would be able to offer to farmers so um, over the past year alone I suppose different things that we've got very involved in have been the issues around fertilizer and talking to merchants and trying to make uh, funding available to farmers to help pay the fertilizer bills at a given time. Also to contractors, uh, you know, to talk to farmers as well in relation to uh, paying the contractors bills. And look, other areas that we're talking about at the moment and have funding available for is the whole green area around renewables, whether that's solar panels, etc. And that's something that farmers are showing a good bit of interest uh, in and it's improving all the time. So all I'd say to you is that we're a bit like the GA, there's credit unions in every locality. Those credit unions and particularly the ones in the Cultivate uh, want to do business with farmers. We, we want to be an alternative there from the banks. Uh, we are an alternative. And all I'd say to you is to go in have a chat, give us a shout, have a chat, see uh, if what we can offer fits you better than anyone else. Because as I said, the turnaround is very quick, a uh, couple of days. Um, and 
if you want to check it up yourself, it's very easy to look it up on the, on the website cultivate.ie or there's a low call number as well, 1-800-839-9999. So if you want to find out more information. So David, I think I leave it at that. There's two great speakers to come after me here now. So uh, they'll have a lot of stuff to say that are that will be of interest to the farmers. And I just urge you to try and get involved in the questions and answers and the debate when we're finished speaking. Thanks very much, David. Thanks, Joe. And look, if you're not off the hook, I'll be coming back to you with a few questions as the evening progresses. And as Joe said, um, please pop any questions you have for the panel into the Q&A box. Now, Philip O'Connor, um, a good man to give us a succinct summary of what's happening in the world. Philip, give us a one minute overview of how each of the sectors have performed in 2022. Um, oh God, one minute. Um, I'll take a little bit more than one minute. But I suppose, look, we look at them and and, and the different sectors. Um, so the dairy sector, like, I mean, we we came into the year in 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 this year with probably a, a, yeah a, a, a cloud over the sector, wondering. We knew the costs were going up. We had a very indication Ukraine the fertilizer costs. We knew without a certainty that they were going up. There was a lot of uncertainty where milk price went. Um, luckily, and thank God for for dairy farmers, it went to record prices there's farmers at the moment getting paid over 80 cents a litre based on solids and so forth at the moment so the dairy farm has dairy uh, sector has performed incredibly well this year like I'm um, I don't think it's it'd be unfair to say that um it'd be incorrect to say that it'll probably be the greatest profit year dairy has ever seen if you know what I mean so it's been a really strong positive year and that has been all based on milk price like costs have gone up we're seeing costs gone up on average 10 11 cents um i'm seeing farmers in the high 30s and possibly the low 40s of cost per litre reduced milk but there we're seeing that the average milk price for most farmers is probably going to come into the, the mid 60s give or take like so it's been milk price by milk price milk price that has driven the profitability in the dairy sector this year so yes yeah, so really positive year for dairy farmers in that regard Beef farmers then a little bit different. Um, I suppose the beef price did go up. I mean, it is in relative terms a strong beef price, but the costs have probably hit them more. Like so, we're not seeing that the the beef price are going to make exponentially more than what they did in twenty one. Probably seeing maybe a little bit, maybe a tiny bit above. Haven't got the final figures really yet. Tigers are predicting a a drop on twenty one, but not massive. Um, I think for most beef farmers, if they held their, their profitability, now I'm talking about before subsidies, um, at 21 levels, they'd be reasonably happy as well. Probably fair to say, and the same with sheep as well. Um, there's some very strong prices on sheep, like over eight euros a kg, like, and hearing some of the, the lowland sheep have done quite well. So, again, 21 was a good year for them, and it's looking like 22 could be on par with it as well. So, two, you would call reasonably solid years for, for, for beef and sheep without being exceptional. Um, but then 21 was a strong year. The tillage guys, then it's it's kind of been a slightly bit little bit mixed. Like, I mean, some of the tillage guys, I mean, there's some some slightly mixed yields, but and depends on how much forward they bought, they bought into 22. So some of the tillage farmers that forward bought fertilizer into 22, so they didn't get hit with that full fertilizer cost in 22, like um, like other like some farmers did, and had strong yields, like some of the crops were quite strong, like because the average tillage price price for ton was over 300 euros a ton like so the price was quite strong so we are seeing a little bit of variance i'm seeing some really strong profitability in some tillage farmers but didn't see not so strong in others and that was led down to um yeah some yield variance i mean pat would be a bit more expert in this but there was some variance in some of the yields across some of the crops if you know what i mean and and in some places got a bit high, harder than others in the drought, so it did affect. So it was kind of more regional based a little bit on some of the drops and yields in um, the tillage sector. Um, I suppose if you look at the other couple of sectors and the pig farmers, God, the, the, the fig farmers, I, I tell you, I really have the, my admiration for the pig sector is like how they they can work through some of the stuff they went through. Like they went into like losses. I mean, actual cash losses at the start of this year, like losing. I had a, a farmer where I did a set of figures and he actually paid more on feed than he got paid on pigs in the month of February. So he lost money on feed alone, never mind all the other costs. It was, it was, yeah, it's it's the the phenomenal resilience. Um they are back to a little bit just above break even at the moment. But I mean the losses they carry for the first six months of the year were huge. Like you're talking upwards of 35, 40 euros a pig of losses potentially if you know what I mean. Like so we have farmers there, we've pig farmers carrying six, seven, eight hundred thousand euros of losses. Like I mean it's been real tough, tough 18 months for pig farmers. Um 
poultry guy is not going too bad, depending on how it, it feeds with energy costs of some of the contracts they have with it. So some of the contracts, some poultry farmers that have, that it's the suppliers who are carrying the energy and feed costs, other ones will be carrying that. Like, so slightly mixed bag on that one. And the, the vegetable sector, and probably an area you know a good bit about, David, because I know you work with some people in it, like it's the energy crisis, the energy costs that's really hitting them hard, if you know what I mean. They're not getting the the prices. So the prices have an exponentially rose for them, but their costs have, and that's mainly through energy in the greenhouses, if you know what I mean. It's, as we all know, it's doubled and tripled, if you know what I mean. And that's really, well, it's crucified their margin. They have no margin. Like, and like, there is people leaving that sector. Um, and just like the pig sector, like, I mean, we're, they're expecting maybe upwards of 10 to maybe even 50% probably might not survive this, like with the pig sector. Like it's, it hasn't happened yet, like, but only a business can survive losses for so long. Correct. Philip, that's a good, that's a good summary. And um, when you mention um, the glass houses, like we, we, we do work with people in the glass house sector where two years ago, their cost of gas was about a hundred thousand a year, and um, that went up to two hundred thousand, and then this year hit five hundred thousand at times. So, um, very like seriously challenging the more than the pig sector, but um, really good news on dairy and tillage. And Pat, I suppose we're in a big time of change in farming at the moment, and an awful lot of the farmers who will be on this call tonight, um, are in the beef sector. Cultivate definitely works. You know, say seventy percent with beef farmers, and say twenty five percent with dairy farmers. Um, so just give us a feel for set the scene for 2023 and what's coming down the tracks um, for the sector. Um, so much is changing. Uh, we have a new cap. Uh, we have the fertilizer and veterinary medicines register coming in. We have a new TAMS. We have ACRES, which is the new agri environmental scheme. Um, we've got changes to uh, banding, which is how cows are going to be assessed in terms of the carbon loading that they will bring, which effectively will affect stocking rate. And we... <clears throat> the... Pat, you're just going on to mute there, Pat, unfortunately. If we if we look at all those things in tandem, um, it, it's sweeping change. And um, it's kind of at the moment, it's, it's the season for AGMs. We were just at the AGM for... Uh, uh, the ICMSA on Monday. Um, we had the uh, Fianna Fáil conference um, on agriculture on Saturday. The previous Saturday was the Green Party's AGM. And um, <clears throat> there's uh, agriculture and the Jim Wolf was talking at the Fianna Fáil one, and he talked about how uh, we can't forget the fact that the farming has always evolved and changed. This is not new. Um, and it, it, it's, uh, it's not to be feared. But having said that, so many things are changing together that farmers are going to find it hard to cope, especially as we've had a year where uh, the, the, uh, the base in terms of costs uh, was transformed so much in terms of feed, fertilizer and fuel through 2022. And looking forward, really, um, we've got to remember that we've just come through that period of intense change. <clears throat> in terms of the changes to the cap and how they will affect farmers, um, more productive farmers with higher, um, who, who typically have higher payments, which are based on the historical output of the farm at the turn of the century, will have cuts to their payments. Um, and far farmers who are more extensive, who have had lower historical payments, will see their payments increase slightly. Um, we have a lot of farmers getting slight increase in their payments and a lot of farmers getting a small decrease in their payments and then a small cohort of very intensive farmers such as cattle finishers seeing huge cuts in their payments and that's going to affect those people's ability to um, to trade through 20 you know it will, will, will have an impact um, <clears throat> the Matt, other I might, I might come in there and just say we, we yep. go deeper into some of those topics um, in a few minutes. But Joe, yeah. I might just call you back in there just to comment on what Pat said. Is that like you were out in Brussels today um, on, on, on that committee? Is is what Pat's saying happening right across Europe at the moment? Is the like Pat is sort of laying out a picture of an awful lot of change in Irish farming? Is that happening across Europe? It is, uh, absolutely. And I suppose its effects vary from country to country. Like as late as yesterday, we had a meeting and it was attended by uh, the Commissioner for Agriculture, Wojciechowski. And to be truthful, I didn't expect an awful lot going into it. Uh, and I came out, you know, uh, 
having having been justified in my lack of expectation of what he might say or what he might add, because the whole thing of one of our own politicians talking about a uh, cardboard box in the back south facing window springs to mind when I when I listen to our commissioner. And the unfortunate part of it there is that his weakness as a representative for agriculture is compounded by Franz Timmermans, uh, who's uh, the vice president of the EU Commission, and he has responsibility for, for implementing the Green Deal. And he's very, very strong. And the Green Deal, unfortunately for farmers, is in his brief and not in uh, in our agricultural commissioner's brief. So, uh, you know, he didn't get an easy uh, an easy run at yesterday's meeting. But sometimes you nearly feel when you're talking to him and putting points across to him that it's like throwing water at a glass, hoping that it'll penetrate through it. Uh, I'm not so sure it did. And like he made big, and we had John Clark, um, who's involved in the, the international trade side of DG Agri, on before him, and both of them made big on the fact that the eu is the largest exporter of agri food products in the world that there's a trade surplus there of 62 uh, billion euro we export 184 billion euros worth of food and we import 122 so that huge surplus or surplus is there i put the question to the commissioner that <coughs> in light of the green deal with the reduction in um chemical pesticides the large reduction in the uh, chemical fertilizer and also the fact that he wants to you to go, the target is there to go from 8% organic across the EU of an average up to 25% across the EU. What's that going to do to this surplus? And look, he had no answer for it. Uh, if we see, David, I'll just finish on this, you know, over the last two decades, uh, the European, the number of farmers in the European Union has dropped from 15 million to 9 million uh, farmers. And it's unlikely under his watch, I, I asked him, you know, was there a strong chance that under his watch, the European Union from a farmer's point of view would turn into uh, a union of play, uh, primroses, uh, pixies and playgrounds? And um, I don't think he was too happy with the comment, but, you know, that's one of the challenges. But there's an awful lot, of, David, of the other challenges that haven't gone away, the likes of... Yeah. Brexit, climate change is there. But I would say that the Irish farmers are probably in a stronger position than any farmers across Europe. If we look at the targets that's there going forward, like I, I just looked at the, the dairy sector and there was a, a, a total turnover of, or the value of the dairy sector across Europe and dairy products was about 495 billion euro. That's expected by... Um, 2030 to have gone to 640 billion euro. Similarly, and I'll finish definitely on this, in the beef sector, the uh, total value of global, uh, the global beef sector in 2022 was 395 billion euros. Sorry, 415 up from 395 last year. And that's expected to rise to 604 billion euros by the end of the decade. So despite all the trends, despite all the fads, People do know that, that taste and nutrition are top of their list, and that comes with dairy product and with meat. But Joe, you're saying that um, the whole idea of food security, which is going to be a big global challenge, we are seeing it with in, in Ukraine in terms of the grain that's leaving the Ukrainian ports. We're seeing it in the reduction in fertilizer use across Africa, across Europe, is reducing food um, production. The Green Deal is still on track the, that, that new worldview hasn't changed European policy in any way. No, there's absolutely no let up uh, from from the likes of the commissioner yesterday. Last week, we had the vice chairman of <coughs> the Agri Committee in the European Parliament in to speak to us. I didn't know much about him beforehand, and he said he was a farmer in France. So I thought, well, this is fairly ideal for a vice chairman of the Agri Committee. He absolutely lambasted the cap. Uh, and then he said that the cap had led, and this was a, an incredible statement by a man in his position, that the cap had led to European farmers continuing to produce food in atrocious conditions. So if you have Timmermans, you have our Ag Commissioner, and you have this guy who's from the Green side, uh, Green Party in France um, as Vice Chair of the European Parliament, it just shows 
the role and the job that's out there for the farm representatives and the farm organisations to ensure a future for, for our for food producers. So we'll come back from that level um, and from that European level and bring it back to how European policy and Irish national policy is going to impact on farmers. And I suppose the most clear place, and I'll go back to you, Philip, is in the nitrates reduction that's coming down the line for next year. And I suppose the impact that will have on dairy farmers and I suppose an unintended consequence, the impact it will have on beef and suckler farmers. Yeah, well, we're starting to see a bit of that already. See, I work with farmers on a one-to-one -one basis doing budgets and projections and looking forward. And I suppose the, the main sector it, it, it's affecting in the dairy sector is the guys that are going into that higher band who are, it's, it's, a, it's a huge increase in the nitrates from- Can you explain uh, the higher nitrate. band to us, please? Yeah, so at the moment, a cow is, is equivalent to pushing out 89 kgs of nitrogen. The middle band is moving to 92, but the upper band is moving to 106. So it's a big increase. So in theory, then you need to have more land or you need to figure out if, if, you're, if you're going above 250 kgs nitrogen and you're in nitrogen irrigation, you're talking about export and slurry, but that's not all possible. Really what it's, it's meaning for those guys going to the higher band that they're in, they have two real choices really. It's, it's, it's cull cows or find more land or a combination of both. So what, we're, what I'm finding and discussing with farmers at the moment, especially in that category is it's it's a combination of everything if you know what I mean and there's a, there's a lot of other factors in it as well like so you're talking about drilling down into those accounts and looking seeing how efficient the farm is so you don't just keep cows for the sake of keeping cows so there might be an element of culling so culling is not bad in if it's done for the right reasons from the, and the right way so there are, it is about choosing the right cows that you want to carry forward and maybe that will be side of it it will be looking at getting availability of land that's not always possible there's parts of the country where land as we all know we we read the journals and other 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 blogs and other things and there's some crazy prices for land out so that mightn't be an option either um there's looking at possibility of how much you can export and if you're going into derogation what you can do there with with with, with um sorry storage but there's other factors involved as well like where is is interesting at a farm the other day and he would look and have to be producing about 35 cows um but he had a full-time labor unit on the farm and to reduce back 35 cows would mean he probably wouldn't be able to afford a full-time labor unit and he was getting to an age where milking seven days a week wasn't really what he wanted if you know what i mean so it was an interesting dynamic, like if you know what I mean, that how he was going to, and we have to sit down and figure out how we're going to possibly, he's in, on the face of it, he was okay with reducing cows if he had to, but what he wanted to make sure is that the farm would profit enough to afford the labour unit that he wanted on the farm. So the, the man that was working with him, working for a man of years, part of his team on the farm, that he wanted him there because he didn't want to go back to seven days of milk, days of milk milking, if you know what I mean. So just looking at that. So there's a lot of dynamics on it. The most important thing I would say, if anyone's on this webinar who is who who is nitrates is being an issue, if you know what I mean, a, a genuine proper issue, you need to sit down and look at it holistically as regards. It's not just, yeah, go get more land. No, I'm going to cut cows. You need to look at the whole farm as regards what your profitability, what your slurry storage are, where you are in the night stash, nitrates. Are you going into derogation or are you in derogation already? And how that's going to affect you. So it's it's looking at the entire thing. And I would be advising farmers to sit down, their ag advisors sit down, their accountant, because we will have farmers that probably that the, 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 the KPIs in the farm, for want of a better word, their performance in the farm is probably not brilliant. If it mightn't be where it could be, if you know what I mean. So maybe culling for a period of time might be a good thing. And they'll have a problem in a year or two time or two or three years time when they get those efficiencies put up. And then that might be the time that they might go look for additional land. So Pat, every farm is different. I'm going to bring Pat in there. Pat, how tuned in do you think farmers are or how well informed are they on these changes that are coming? What's the journal view on this? It's hard to gauge because, I mean, you go to a meeting and there's a couple of, pardon me, a couple of hundred people in the room, a lot of engagement, a lot of questions, but there's 130,000 farmers in the country. And um, we know that, you know, uh, we sell 60,000 odd copies a week. So at least half the farmers in Ireland are reading the paper. The farmers who are most affected, uh, no doubt about it, are dairy farmers. Um, uh, a limited number of beef farmers who are up uh, at the kind of uh, uh, stocking levels. And the other thing is that because banding is the issue this year, um, which will affect stocking rates, uh, the banding will not affect uh, sucker cows in the same way as it will affect dairy cows because they're, they're rated in a different way. So 
<clears throat> um, that issue um, is, uh, I think, has penetrated the cohort of farmers who will be affected by it. Um, but the broader issues, how well farmers understand just how much change uh, is coming through the schemes, uh, it's hard to gauge. And, and there's two sides to it, because it's one thing to know how much change is coming uh, in the abstract. It's another when it actually happens and when it hits your pocket. And um, when you know the money that was there in previous years isn't there, what do you do? Um, so, I mean, I, I think for um, credit unions <coughs> to be on their guard, the farmers are going to be coming in next year. Uh, they may be, especially if input costs stay very high, uh, farmers are going to be looking at ca cash flow measures. The other thing is that we, when we go into the new um, new schemes, TAMS kicks off again. A lot of farmers had maxed out on TAMS uh, or close to maxed out. And some of them are, that we have another week to go in the last tranche of the old TAMS. And some farmers will be applying for that. But everyone starts again. So um, I would expect to see a lot of farmers looking for um, TAMS and TAMS approval. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of farmers looking for uh, solar, which there's up to 90,000 available. Uh, for farmers to uh, install solar panels. Within that, there's an issue. And um, this is where everyone's going to have to be quite creative because you're not allowed to take out a term loan on the matching funding. You have to have cash in hand. And I think that um, it's not too late yet. I think governments and uh, financial institutions need to get together to find a mechanism to allow farmers with limited cash flow um, who need to invest in their facilities, especially for farm safety and for slurry storage, to be able to find the matching funding. Um, and I think that that's a priority that needs to be worked on now and through the new year. Um, the TAM scheme will last for four years. Yeah. Just one comment on the political dynamic, very briefly, and that is that the, when the commissioner came over and addressed the IFA uh, in the summer, he talked about the fact that you know food security is back on the agenda but he was talking about it in terms of the next cap for 2027 which he's starting to now turn towards and the attitude in brussels is after a fraud process which last year is between the commission the parliament and the ministerial council the current cap is put to bed it's done and the conversation now is around the next cap which won't come into being until 2027 so like that's how slowly the machinery of brussels moves and, uh, you know, the invasion of Ukraine has changed everything um, in terms of the dynamic around food production, food security and, and input availability. So uh, I, I think there's going to have to be a more rapid response. How that happens, I'm not sure. OK, two comments on that. Joe, you're not sensing that rapid response in Brussels at the moment, are you? And not and that question that Pat has just raised there that was put very very clearly to him yesterday that in light of all that has happened in the past two years and around the whole area of food security that there really is a very justifiable reason to revisit the cap because everything has changed so much but he absolutely didn't answer that or wasn't going anywhere near it uh, at, at the meeting yesterday. OK, one of the unintended consequences, just going back to the nitrates piece, and I know we focused on dairy farmers because that is 100 percent, 90 percent where all the impact will be. But for beef and suckler farmers in intensive dairy regions, access to land either to buy it, lease it or rent it is going to become very awkward. Pat, comment. <laughs> Uh, absolutely, absolutely true. Um, and, and for tillage farmers as well. I, I'm a tillage farmer and um, not renting a whole lot of land, but uh, prices here have been up in the high 400s. Uh, and that's not just for Conacre, that's for five year lease. And <coughs> um, there are parts of the country, as Philip said, where land is just not available. If you take, say, West Cork, um, there isn't a spare acre of, uh, you know, uh, of high output value. Um, you also have the other thing where the department are now getting real about cracking down on map acres, where uh, the grazing platform is now going to be the grazing platform, and someone having land, you know, more than uh, a, a tractor drive away, uh, that won't be, you know, that's going to be problematic. So farmers need to source land close to home, and there just won't be enough to go around for all the different demands and pressures that are there. Okay. 
we might just turn our attention to the environmental issues and how, you know, what's knocking about at the moment. So we've seen Minister McConnell and Minister Hackett announce really, really dramatic changes in the forestry grants. As you mentioned in the new TAMS, solar panels are going to be highly subsidised. Um, and we have a new acre scheme, which got a lot of bad publicity when it came out, but that seems to have quietened down now. And most people seem to be able to get into four and a half thousand up to seven thousand euro. So, um, Philip, do you want to <coughs> on, the, on the grants that are available or the grants that are coming in for, from an environmental perspective? Oh God, um, thanks, David. Um, yeah, the grants. Look, we we've talked. Like, I mean, there is the well, the base is coming in, so we've kind of touched that a little bit. So the new base and Chris, and I suppose there's nothing you can really do about the base and Chris. It's coming, but I suppose what is available is you can go out to the department website and calculate what your base and Chris and your eco payment will be next year for probably a large portion of farms in this country there's going to be cuts on it but there's some people will be going up but you can it is a calculable figure it is there um you can see what the eight measures are you can you can calculate whether you meet the criteria for the um the habitat zones and different things like that um the other ones that are interesting though like i say like the tams one is definitely very interesting like and they've kind of like in the previous TAMS, we had TAMS 2, and it was just the TAMS grant. And then they brought out the, the LESS scheme, which is the Low Emission Surrey scheme. And that was really successful. It was a very targeted scheme at a Pacific job in order to get slurry, uh, more modern slurry tanks, slurry equipment onto farms and getting rid of the splash bait with a trail and shoe. So they're continuing in that, on that scheme, which is definitely a positive. But they then they've brought in the solar panel scheme that Pat mentioned. So it's just going to be targeted solar panels. So you now you'll have your... It's it's rebranded. Oh God, it's a it's a strange acronym, but we call it for want of word stands three for here today. So you have your standard capital grant scheme, you now have your S scheme, and you also have now the solar panel scheme. So they're targeted grants at that. Like I I do see significant uptakes on that solar one. There's a lot of farmers waiting for it, looking at it with the high energy costs that are out there at the moment. You'll get your up to um, 50, 60% of 90,000 spend back. You can claim your VAT back as a VAT 58. If it's a qualified asset, which it is already revenue of confirmed, you can get your um, accelerated capital allowances on it. And with the with the energy cost, you, you'd assume that you'd reduce your, your energy cost in your farm. So I do think there'll be a significant uptake in that. The other TAMS grant that came in then is for the 60% um, TAMS grant to the standard TAMS grant uh, for women over the age of 40 up to the age of 66. So in other words, that they can get access to the 60% TAMS grant on that. Um, and that's the, the main qualifying criteria, obviously that it's for women in agri over the age of 40, because if you're under the age of 40, you can get the young farmers one and you have to have uh, the green sort on it, but you can claim that up to 60. Um, it, it's, it's a brand new scheme. It's a brand new target at a very particular sector of the agri community. So it'll be really interesting to see how the uptake that will work. The registered farm partnerships are continuing, which is a positive. So it's allowing that's, um, I know you mentioned at the start there, David, succession, the registered farm partnerships really work well towards that. And that scheme is continuing. So it's allowing farmers come, in, come together, but predominantly, let's be honest, the registered farm partnerships really been used succession tool for farmers to bring in sons or daughters onto the farm and get some enhanced grants around it, farm together and start that succession process. Um, the young farmers top-up scheme, it's definitely been enhanced. Um, so previously it was give or take on 50 hectares, a little over 3,250, give or take. That's nearly been uh, gone up two and a half times. So if you maximize that young farmer's top up scheme, it's up to about 8,150, um, 163 euros per on the first 50 hectares. So it's a real nice incentive, like to bring the next generation into the farm, if you know what I mean. Um, Joe, even look at your, you're still farming in Galway. Um, solar acres forestry grants are any of them you know topics of discussion apart from Galway hurling and football with your neighbors and pals uh they very much are but like you know uh, again it took a, a last minute decision by the minister to extend the acres because it was it was very poorly handled earlier on in relation to timelines and you had uh you know whether it was consultants or chagas people working over weekends to try and walk farms and that and get it in. But I think, you know, despite a lot of the issues that we've highlighted there, um, I would say that quite a few of them 
there, there's a bit more certainty around them. We mightn't like the final results, but there's a bit more certainty there now. Whether Pat alluded to it earlier on, CAP is there now. We, we can give out all we like about it, but it's there. We have an idea what it's going to look like for the next five years. Um, the, the likes of the acres, the likes of the TAMS grants. Also, if we, if we roll it on a bit, um, the targets, the emission targets, you know, and a huge amount of work had to go in there. Uh, because you had some of the other sectors that were maybe being hit with higher targets given out uh, and given out a lot and saying that agriculture, despite, which is a very disingenuous figure, it's not inaccurate, but it's disingenuous when people point to us as being the largest uh, producer of emissions. We are that because we're the largest uh, sector. We don't have the heavy industry to dilute down the emissions from agriculture. So the emissions are there at 25%. They're going to be hard met. Uh, there's a huge challenge there. But I think there's a lot of work around there. And I mentioned the people that uh, spoke at our meeting yesterday, but Sean Coughlin of ICBF also addressed the meeting and what's going on there around the whole area of EBI and what that can lead to reducing uh, the emissions breeding of the more efficient type cows, yeah. whether that's in the suckler or the dairy sector. We have the Chagas Mac curve, the use of the less uh, low emission slurry spreading equipment, clover and swords, multi species. So, protected urea. yeah, protected urea. So, you know, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of um, technology there, um, there's a lot of advice. So, I think there will be a huge challenge to meet the targets. Um, but I, I think, you know, we, we have, we stand a good chance of getting a good way to meeting them over the next few years. And if we do that, we can be world leaders. We can turn a lot of this to our advantage on the world market. And particularly from a country that exports 90% of our two biggest products, uh, dairy and beef, um, almost half of our sheep, you know, it's, it would be very, very important to have that point of difference there and leading in this area and sustainability and continue to add power to the origin green brand Pat, yeah. up to you um the forestry grants a perspective on those because they've jumped by 44 to 66 percent in cases yeah two things about that first thing is that um while the difficulties around filling licenses the backlog pertains farmers are not interested in planting the other one is the replanting in a uh, requirement for farmers who have clear felled uh, plantations now have to replant at their own expense um, <clears throat> and that is mandatory and uh, in other words once you go into forestry and take the grant that's a permanent commitment it's forever so um, farmers don't want to commit land to that and um, right now uh, those those are the main two obstacles to farmers going into uh, forestry and I, th I think there is an understanding within government <laughs> that that's the case whether it be addressed or not but in the broader sense of uh, food production and its relationship with uh, the, the fight against climate change I was struck um, by the attendance and the optimism and the can-do attitude uh, of the Johnstown Open Day in September and um, the uh, I wrote at the time that the, the torch it felt like the torch had been passed within Chagask in terms of the flagship um, project to drive Irish agriculture from Moor Park to Johnstown. We've gone from output efficiency to uh, in that sweet spot between um, output, profitability, sustainability in economic and environmental terms. And, and there's an interesting quote from Jim Wolfe, uh, which will be in tomorrow's paper, uh, from uh, the Fianna Fáil uh, Ag Conference on Saturday, and he said that financial rewards from bracing climate change measures will be very much to the forefront in 2023. Significant funds will be put into milk price if farmers follow the critical measures required to get the carbon number right. So he's not talking about um, the far future, he's talking about the near future, and he's not talking about scheme incentives, he's talking about where the carbon uh, number <coughs> attached to your milk output will become a core element of your milk price. We've been talking about this for decades, but that's the kind of change that's going to come very quickly when it comes. Once one co-op adopts it, everyone will follow quite quickly. It will become an industry standard within years. And that's really highly commercial because that's hitting your milk check. And if there's anything that's going to change behavior, it's when it hits you in the pocket. And the other scheme, I was at the Chagas um, climate change launch last week, 
Um, they launched the slime host program um, the, the next phase of it, where they're hoping that they'll have 50,000 people involved in the slime post program over the next um, seven years. They're going to try and give everybody a certain number for their carbon output and then look as a benchmark and then look to bring it down. Um, so it was quite a positive meeting from a Chagas perspective. A um, lot of industry there, and it seemed um, <coughs> there is a roadmap for us to follow as a farming community to hit those targets? Yeah, there is. And um, further to that, in terms of the, you know, the deep analysis that's been done around uh, the carbon exchanges in our soils and the, the amount of carbon that's going in uh, and uh, being sequestered, uh, the amount of carbon that's being emitted, uh, both from our mineral soils, but especially from our peatlands and our wetlands, uh, the, the more intensive the research, the better the figures are getting. Now, there's no free pass here. Um, there will not be a free pass. And there's going to be intense pain in, for some farmers on peatlands. Um, we don't know which peatlands yet. We don't know when. But the reality is that um, the, the figures, though better, will still be very problematic because um, uh, that's small, about 8% of our land is peatland, um, of our farmland. Uh, but but the the net emissions from that eight percent way supersede the net carbon sink that the rest of our farmland is. So and that will have to be tackled. But the figures are improving, and uh, you know that reduces the scale of the problem. The other one then, and this must be remembered, is that the science is settled around climate change. We know <coughs> we know climate change is real. I don't think any. You know, anyone credibly really argues against that anymore. But the science around the uh, uh, bovines and the methane cycle around bovines, biogenic methane, as it's called, is far from settled. Alan, he's not a crank. He's an IPCC scientist. He's uh, one of the foremost experts on methane in the world. And he is now gaining credibility for the argument that we are misrepresenting uh, the level of emissions and the, the warming effect of emissions from the dairy herd and the beef herd globally. And I think that that issue has the potential to make the figures much more manageable for farming. I'll make a prediction now, David. Yes. Agriculture will be the only one of the six sectors that will come within an asses roar of meeting its sectoral target. Okay, so Pat, you've made that prediction. And I'm going to come to you, Joe, as well on this question. Why are we not communicating that story? And why are we really, really, as an ag sector, seen as the bold boy or the bold girl on the, on the naughty step of climate change? Joe? Well, I, I think, first of all, there's a certain section of the, the non-agri media that that narrative doesn't suit so it suits them to ignore it uh, how often have we all passed that comment that uh, Pat has co has commented on there uh, we had um, Frank Mithloner he's a professor of animal science in the University College of Davis in California over at an IFA meeting in January 2020 of methane and how if you keep animals numbers stable well then um can you hear me there yeah no you're perfect yeah. go ahead um that if you keep the animal number stable that like this biogenic cycle is really where the cow belches out the methane it goes into the atmosphere after 10 or 12 years unlike other carbon dioxide from fossil fuels the animal methane is broken down it's um sequestered by the grass through photosynthesis and then it's converted, the animal eats the grass and produces the milk. So it just goes through the whole circle again. We have repeated and repeated that, but there's large sections of uh, the media and some of them, um, they're not directly from the agri-media, but they're reporting on agri in the media and uh, it doesn't suit their narrative either. And it's unfortunate um, that the sciences, but it's good to see the likes of Miles Allen and uh, fr uh, Frank Mithloner gain more traction but you know we have to keep repeating it if it's 
farm organisations or if it's the Farmers Journal or the other agri-media, we constantly have to stay putting out this message, whether we put it out last week, that doesn't mean that we can't put it out this week and hopefully, because you even see at the moment, David, with the the likes of the Beyond Meat and the Oat Milk, a lot of the truths are coming out. It's a bit like if we go back a few years ago, everyone was giving out about butter and next thing, Time magazine, yeah. I'd say it was about 2014, it had the scoop of butter on its front page and it started praising it. And that led to a huge recovery in the consumption of dairy products and butter, uh, you know, in a short space of time. So it's to get to the key influencers and, and get them moving on it. And, and, and get to key influencers outside of our core agri um, farming um, bubble. Pat, are you OK there? Pat has a terrible cold this evening. So for anyone that's listening tonight, Pat is really, um, he's, he, he, he's got out of the bed more or less now to, to do this. So we really appreciate it, Pat. Um, Pat, your, your view there on that whole marketing side and how we actually market agriculture and how, to, to, to a certain extent, we're, we really are losing that battle. Uh, I don't know that we are. <clears throat> I think there's an awful lot of noise around agriculture, but... <clears throat> Um, with no disrespect to either party, if you have Danny Healy Ray and John Gibbons on arguing about food production, they represent two extremes of viewpoints. The vast majority of consumers are voting with their pockets every week. The vast majority of producers, uh, similarly, I think what we're looking at is that they're in the interest of balance, the two extremes are engaging in the debate in the public forum, especially it makes great radio, but it doesn't make good public policy. And thankfully, um, we have a consensus within government um, uh, and, and within parliament around the, the necessity to sustain food production. I would send one of those warning around that, that <coughs> as a commercial tillage farmer, um, Pippa Hackett, in response to a question for myself at the Green Party conference two weeks ago, uh, seem to say that, that she envisages a near future with no pesticides, um, which uh, because of our, our warm, damp, uh, mild climate, um, it's good for uh, growing crops, but it's also good for growing fruit and vegetables. It's also good for fungal infections. It's good for loads of little pests uh, and it's good for weeds to grow along with the crops. So without uh, plant protection products, which is is their official title, um, we're doomed in terms of food production from tillage, fruit and vegetables uh, in, in this country. And one point that can't be overstated, but Philip rightly pointed out the fruit and vegetables being vulnerable, along with poultry and pigs, uh, from the uh, fr from the rapid increase in costs. Uh, there's one huge difference, and and I think it it points to the vulnerability domestically here, and that is that fruit and vegetables are being produced solely for the domestic market. And the vast majority of the fruit and vegetable growers have relationships, close business and trading relationships with our retailers. And those retailers let those farmers down this year. And the lack of, it's amazing that global markets responded to our dairy, beef and sheep, uh, lamb meat, but our domestic markets utterly failed to have the same response for food and vegetable uh, soap growers. And that shows that we have huge work to do in that regard. And it's not the consumer's fault. We shouldn't expect them to pay more than they're asked. It's, it's on the retailers and it's on this regulators coming in next year to ensure that we have sustainability as well as transparency in the food chain, especially the short food chain. OK, thank you, Pat. We're coming up to the last couple of minutes of tonight's um, conversation. Philip, just succession, it's something that you're often seen discussing and talking about. What are you seeing in succession at the moment and the transfer of farms from one generation to the next? Well, every farmer in theory goes through it twice. Once, when, and in theory, when the, most farmers inherit their farm and they will pass it, ideally, most farmers like to pass it on to the next generation. Yeah, look, succession, there is no there is no one fix. There's no like right way or in theory wrong way. But I suppose there's there's better ways of going about it. And I would say the best way to go about it is always communication. Um, a lot of farmers would come in to us and sit down with us and say, oh, thinking about doing this, what do you think? 
and they need to come when they're coming into somebody like ourselves an accountancy firm or um, a solicitor firm whatever right they need to have some idea of what they would like to do and then we can start building a plan around that like i mentioned earlier on there uh, about registered farm partnerships and I love that that sector. It's it's the way we did our own succession at home, myself and my brother on our own farm, if you know what I mean. It's a really good way of bringing somebody into the farm that, and I suppose it works well from the farmer point of view, as in you have somebody in the family who wants to farm, and it's a really good way of getting them into the farm, working with you without handing over assets. But look, it, 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 it can be a contentious issue. Um, I, I, I fully believe in open communication and, and, and trying to talk your way through it. I, I believe as well that when you're looking at families and trying to um, make wills and divide up your assets, it's not about dividing your assets equally. It's about dividing it fairly. It's not King Solomon. You can't just divide everything down the middle. So it's about looking at the broader thing. And it's, it's yeah, it's, it's and then at that stage, I suppose you can get involved with, with, with professions and looking at like, I mean, there's a lot of taxations issues around inheritance, if you know what I mean, with CGT and CAT and so forth like that and stamp duty. So they can be managed. But I mean, you do need to have that initial conversation first to decide where you would like your farm to go and what you would like to do with it. And it's that stage you can bring in the professions, whether it's people like ourselves in a county firm, your ag advisors, solicitors. But um, yeah, communication is key in it. Good. Joe and Pat are obviously far too young to be thinking about succession, so we won't we won't um, ask them about succession on a personal level. Um, we come into our predictions now. Pat, you were at the um, Fianna Fáil think tank the other on Saturday, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Was Minister McConnell looking forward to being Minister for Ag on Christmas? <coughs> it was certainly a uh, a, a groundswell of support for that to happen in the room, bar one person who thought he should become Taoiseach in the reshuffle. Uh, we described him as the David Clifford of Fianna Fáil. Right. So, uh, so I think um, uh, I, I would reckon he will, simply because in shifting a Fianna Gael minister into the senior position in agriculture would require a shifting of the ministers of state as well, because there's the balance. If you have a Fianna Fáil senior minister, you have a Fianna Gael a minister of state by agreement. Uh, so <clears throat> it's it's really in the gift of, and the only people who know about it right now are Leo Varadkar and Michal Martin. Uh, they will decide, but but the smart money right now is on a minimal um, uh, reshuffle and um, Charlie McConnell still being in place in uh, Christmas Day. And how would you rate Char Mr. Minister McConnell Logue's tenure? Um, <clears throat> I think we'll know in the fullness of time because so much change has happened in the two and a quarter years since he took office um, that it, it will be quite a while before we can look back on this period uh, of evolution in farm policy and decide what its effect was. But I think he's been a very engaged minister. He's been a very committed minister. He's very, a very accessible minister. He works as hard as he can. And um, I, I would think that most farmers believe there are very few who would have done a better job. Okay. I'm going to go to the predictions round and um, sort of a yes or a no. You can add a comment if you want. The price of fertiliser next spring, up, down, or stay the same? Start with Philip. <coughs> um, yeah, we, we discussed this earlier on. I'm going to say down, but I'll qualify that. I, there's two reasons I think a little bit down is because <laughs> The fertilizer companies are telling us to buy so much of it, which always maybe that's a cynic in me. But I will qualify it is we have four bought fertilizer on our own farm. So I, I'm hedging my bets, if you know what I mean. So on our own farm, we have borrowed, bought a portion of our, our fertilizer for next year, but I didn't go, we didn't go buy 80, 90% of it or anything like that. Like, so we bought a, a portion of it, but I think it'll come down a bit. All right, yeah. Go maybe I'm just being cynical about the fertilizer companies. Um. David, I have a couple of things to say on, on the fertilizer. Um, in our discussion group, the decision was to try and buy as much as we could of it now, not really in relation to price or what the price might do next year, but in relation to the availability of it. Uh, and it was safer to have it in the yard. Second thing I would say is that there's something very, very wrong with the whole system where you see farmers pay 300% more for fertilizer in the past year. And you see the processors, the fertilizer processors make record profits. 
Uh, not the merchants now, uh, so don't get me wrong there, but the processors. And again, we highlighted that to the Ag Commissioner yesterday, um, you know, the lack of control in a system where farmers are absolutely robbed uh, and the figures stand up for themselves to back that up uh, argument up and the process or the manuf man manufacturers report record profits, huge, huge profits. So um, I think I'd be hoping maybe it's the heart rule in the head that it will be slightly less next year, but we were more worried about the availability of it. So it was safer to have it in the yard. Um, Pat O'Toole. Mute. This is myself for coughing purposes. Now, I don't think fertilizer prices are going to change that much. Um, but um, what I'd be watching is grain prices. Um, and grain prices are dull at the moment. So there just isn't money out there at current grain prices <coughs> to buy fertilizer at its current price, never mind more than that. And, and globally, it's really crop prices that set you know, that are the close relationship with fertilizer prices and milk price comes off that. Um, uh, the other thing, there just isn't enough money uh, in the system to continue to pay the kind of prices we had this year. We got through this year, but if you take a merchant with 10,000 tons of grain, buying in 10,000 tons of grain, he needed to find an extra two and a half million euros to pay for that grain this year over last year. That's a phenomenal commitment. And similarly, uh, farmers, had to, you know, all farmers had to find huge amounts of money to secure the fertilizer price or uh, uh, fertilizer supplies and pay for them up front. So we, we had so much credit within the merchants' uh, yards that has vanished over the last 12 months because there isn't enough money to support that credit in, in you know, the, the very changed market. Sorry, that was a long answer to a short question, but I think all prices will come back off the grain price. If the grain grain price starts to go up, fertilizer prices fertilizer prices will will harden, and milk price will stay high. Okay, and um, because they're completely intertwined, we can't yeah. go any into any more depth. We're two minutes to nine. Um, I'd like to thank Pat and Philip in particular for really for joining. Pat in particular with with with, with a heavy enough cold there. So really appreciate you guys joining this Cultivate webinar. And I leave the last word to Chairman of Cultivate, Joe Healy. Well, again, look, uh, David, I'd like to thank yourself for facilitating and IFAC for organising this and particularly as well to Pat and Philip. Um, it's good to have two people that are on the top of their game uh, and have the knowledge to back up any questions that's asked. Um, and also to the people who tuned in this evening, because, you know, we highlighted a lot of the challenges that are there for agriculture. But I think from an Irish agricultural point of view, um, we're the largest and we're the oldest indigenous sector. Last year's agri-food exports from Ireland reached record highs of 15.4 billion euros. Outside of Dublin, agriculture is responsible for between 10 and 14 percent of employment. 8% um, of total merchandise exports and as I said already we export over 90% of our uh, beef and, and milk and a large proportion of our sheep as well. But I think what's very important to highlight the fact of agriculture being the lifeblood of rural Ireland, 90% of the total turnover of Irish agriculture is retained within the economy. Unlike you know some of the other more high the tech sectors, the pharma sectors, and three quarters of all our inputs are sourced locally. Again, highlighting the importance of farmers and agriculture to the local businesses, uh, the local merchants, etc. So, um, I think it's very important that, you know, and again, it goes back and Pat rightly answered it. There is a lot of noise, but I just say to farmers when they just say we're losing that battle in the media. I just say we're still milking cows. We're still producing from the suckler herd. We're producing top quality uh, beef and, and sheep on the sheep farms and tillage. If some of those extremes, and uh, Pat definitely mentioned one of them that gets a free run every Friday evening with a certain uh, on a certain radio station. If some of those extremes got their way and were listened to, uh, they make an awful lot of noise. All we'd have are flowers, shrubs and trees on all our land. We'd have no livestock. So it's important that the ag organization, farm organizations, the likes of IFA, representing over 70,000 members, gets the message across there. The likes of the Farmers Journal gets the message out there as well, that we're producing top quality food at very affordable prices. 
Um, two years ago, there was less than 10%, 8.5% of the average household income was spent on food. If we go back to the 1980s, there was 30% of the average household income spent on food. So CAP is not just for farmers. CAP is a way of farmers producing ad an adequate amount of food for affordable prices for the consumer. So the consumer gains and we're all, we're all taxpayers, we all pay into the CAP. So um, there's a lot of work to be done there, but I think that uh, with the knowledge that we have, the technology that we have, Irish farmers can continue to be global leaders in the whole area of food production, and particularly from a sustainability point of view. And Cultivate Credit Unions will be there to back them up all the way. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. And thank you, folks, and good night.